My, Lord, my, my name is Kibe Mungai, uh, the team leader is Paul Muite Senior Council, assigned this uh, application, the one from Kerovaya, to me, Professor Ogada, and Mr. Ndegu Ajiro. As I had already indicated to the court, and with the benefit of the submissions from my learned colleagues, we shall try to do our business within an hour. So I'll start first, followed by Mr. Ogada and then Mr. Negwa, for purposes of presenting that application. My Lord, let me start uh, by thanking the court for the decisions that uh, it rendered on last Friday on the questions of directions that it gave for the hearing of the petitions that are before the court. My Lord, I confirm that the process of amending the various petitions is ongoing and will be filed in accordance with the timelines fixed by the court. My Lord, going by the timelines that you gave, it is also my pleasure and appreciation, and that is in, uh, in ensuring with the compliance with the Mutunga rules, that it is possible for your Lordship to ensure that... Uh, in the same way that the month of October we dealt with the political aspects, with the political phases of impeachment, that it is now possible, courtesy of your directions, to ensure that we can be able to have a judgment on merits for purposes of the various petitions that are before you. That would be an absolutely important issue for this court to remember because it is being made as if uh, it will not giving due process and ensuring substantive hearing of this matter that we shall be here until forever. My Lord, all these businesses can actually be concluded within the month of November. That being the case, my Lord, by way of introduction, let me say two things in my own words as counsel representing, I believe, the fourth to eighth petitioners who, are, who filed the application that is before the court. The, the date of your application? Yes, my lord, that, that is exactly the issue. 18th, my lord. The application was filed on the 18th of October. Yes. Okay. My lord, 18, it is uh, supported by an affidavit sworn by Honorable David Muni Madenge on the same date. My Lord, uh, as a, uh, for, purposes, I will, for purposes of the documents, let me start there. We have filed uh, submissions. The submissions were filed yesterday. There is a supplementary we filed today. And we have filed various responses to the affidavits to set aside that my learned colleague, Mr. Ogada, will be referring to them. My Lord, uh, that uh, being the case, I wanted to say that by way of an introduction, there are two broad issues that uh, I can be able to say. My Lord, the, thank you. Yes. My Lord, the first issue is that uh, the petitioners moved the court view of the fact that under Article 3.2 of the Constitution, every citizen of Kenya has an obligation to defend and protect the constitutions of Kenya. That's a broad mandate. And of course, further to the other mandate, that under the Bill of Rights, from Articles 19 to 23, where the Bill of Rights is being violated, they are permitted to come to this Honorable Court to seek for the appropriate release. And therefore, that is the basis upon which they came and have moved this Honorable Court. My Lord, uh, the second broad issue that I wish to cover at this particular stage is to point out that what is basically the big thing about 
the matters that are before you. My Lord, the, ma the big issue for purposes of the matters that are before you is that these impeachment proceedings after you hear us, two possible scenarios are clear. Number one, the deputy president who has already argued his application, as uh, his advocates has pointed out, is an elected deputy president. An election that was conducted on the 9th of August, 2022. My Lord, on account of the vote of impeachment passed by the Senate on the 17th of August, 2024, if the process concludes in accordance to the manner in which it has so far been implemented under Article 149.1 of the Constitution, it would resort into Kenya having an appointed president two years after one who is elected was put into office. My Lord, that's a big thing, whichever way you look at it, for the simple reason that one of the important devices of the 2010 Constitution was to ensure that uh, the holders of the offices of president and deputy president have the direct mandate of the people. So, in a matter where that, that important issue of our constitutions could change, it is our submissions that every absolute care must be taken to ensure that the process and the law leading to this very critical political and legal transformation on our constitution has been addressed. How would this be addressed? My Lord, we shall be arguing together with my learned colleagues that the only way in which this can be done is through the hearing on merits of the petition that are before this court. My Lord, having given that, those introductory remarks, let me come to the application of the 18th of uh, that day and by highlighting the issue that uh, we both clearly know. My Lord, impeachment and many cases, I, I will not go through them. The many cases that uh, have been cited of impeachment shows that impeachment in Kenya has four processes. One, where allegations are made, that is purely political. Muduse went around, collected his evidence, presented. There was a motion, I believe, dated 29th of September, asking Parliament to have this 26th. I'm told 26th of September. That's the stage one of the political process. Stage two of the political process is the stage where the National Assembly approves by a vote of two-thirds of, of, of all the members to allow the, or to, to reject the impeachment motion. My Lord, that was done. There are various issues that have been raised in the majority of the petitions that will be argued in the fullness of time that shows the significant problems when this matter was at the parliamentary level. Top most of them being the impartiality of the speaker and the deputy, together with the manner in which public participation was handled. Stage three, my lords, is the stage of the Senate. The law clearly talks about what the Senate should do, how the voting should be done, and again, there is evidence, my learned colleague, Mr. Ongoya, and uh, Honorable Muite, they pointed out at the significant problems that we had there. I am most interested, my Lord, in the fourth phase. The fourth phase of impeachment, as it has now been established in our jurisprudence, is where these courts <coughs> seek to establish whether there was compliance with substantive law and procedural law by the political organs upon which the mandate of impeachment has been entrusted upon by the Constitution, other laws, and the respective standing orders. Again, my lords, that phase that uh, where the court is supposed to deal with this issue, it is uh, our submissions that uh, this is a stage that this honorable court must ensure because it is the court 
that uh, all aspects and proceedings are dealt with in a manner that we all are hard and I'm happy for the time that uh, the court has agreed to allocate us so that the court with sober minds can be able to decide have the laws of our countries been upheld or not. My Lord, there are clear guidelines that have been set out by our constitutions for purposes of doing that. And my Lord, because we are here because of an application for conservatory orders, under Article 159 of the Constitution, this court has an express duty that uh, in exercising the delegated judicial power of the people of Kenya, it is required, the certain guidelines have been given by the Constitution under Article 159, that is besides other provisions of the Constitution. And uh, one of the most important ones is that, it will, that the court will do substantive justice. Substantive justice is an important issue, and it has specific meaning through the very many decisions that uh, have been rendered over time by the courts of this country. And the, and the clear meaning in plain English, because it is important we understood in plain English, in plain English it means a very simple thing. That, for example, my lords, if we are, have a case of a goat, Mr. X and Mr. Y have a case of a, a goat, this goat should remain alive and uh, should, should, so that at the end of the, of the decision, the court can decide whether it belongs to Mr. X or Mr. Y. That is a very simple meaning of substantive justice. So that, my Lord, substantive justice, therefore, conservatory orders, is a mechanism that our laws preserves the good. Our laws preserves the subject matter of the case. The subject matter of the case, my Lord, is the questions of vacancy in the office of the president going by the Senate the deputy president was impeached. On account of the orders that have been given, that office is yet to be filled. So that, my lord, the question therefore can, uh, is, is easy to define and can be defined this way. That, as we wait for the hearing and determinations of this case, we cannot, it cannot be settled at the interim level that uh, the Honorable Kindiki will now be the deputy president of Kenya, so that as we argue the petitions, there is already the impeachment pro process has been concluded to the disadvantage of the other people, of the other person who is seeking the same office. So that, my Lord, is a simple issue that is very easy to define. So that, my Lord, we shall be arguing that when we come to that particular issue, why on earth, because you have before you because if a conservatory order is a legal mechanism, the legal device that is established by the constitutions to preserve the substratum of the matter and for this court to do substantive justice, how on earth would, does the respondents expect that substantive justice will be possible if the trophy that is being tussled over, that is being contested over, is handed over to them? My Lord, all systems of justice would be offended to be told that it is possible at halftime for one team to be declared to be the winner before the matches is concluded. Why can't we wait for all these issues to be concluded? It is a simple meaning of what substantive justice is all about and uh, the courts, the duties of the court to ensure that the ring is held even for all the parties so that we do not argue over an academic matter, which would be the worst issues that can happen. My Lord, there is a case of the Gatirao Peter Munya. I'm coming to the applications for conservatory order. The principles are very clear. I just need to go on them as quickly as I'm able to. Under Gatirao Munya and other decisions, we have a big authorities, many authorities. The issues were set out very, very clearly. There are three tests. The first test is on the prima facie case. My, Lord, my learned colleagues have set out the various many legal issues that are there. That from the standpoint of the applications that we are arguing 
before you, there are five issues for purposes of the Pima Fashi case to comply with the Gatirao Munya case. The first one, my lord, is public participation. I don't need to go into that. It's a substantive issue in the majority of that issue. My lord, the second issue is what we call the legality of the standing orders of the Senate. My lord, in the petition filed in Kerugoya as 015, the petitioners, amongst other things, are saying that although the Constitution provided for clear timelines on how, for example, the business is going to be conducted, and specifically said that uh, this investigative committee is the only committee that can be able to discharge that constitutional function, the Senate established standing orders under which the, the plenary of the Senate can also resolve that issue. The Constitution of Kenya does not provide for a mechanism on how the Senate can discharge that function. But it is very clear on how that investigating committee is supposed to conduct its business and how the right to hearing is to be given after a finding has been made that there is a case, a case worth responding to. My Lord, I submit that's a big issue on the standing orders that were used to, to pass the vote of impeachment. The second issue that uh, has been sought in that case is the issue of interpretation uh, and application of those laws on impeachment, 44, all those laws, 48, 144, 144, 149, all those have been raised. My Lord, as you clearly know, this is the first impeachment for purposes of those laws. And therefore, if a question of interpretation has been raised specifically before you, it underscores the necessity to ensure that on merits, this court actually determines and interprets the law. So that the next time we have probably to do it against the president or against Kindiki if he gets there, the law would be clear and we shall not be going through all these things. So a serious issue has been raised by that petition. The other serious issues that have been raised is of course the fairness of the Senate proceedings. I will not go into that because already the lawyers for the deputy presidents have raised that issue. And the fifth important issue is the issues of nominations of uh, the Honorable Kindiki. The act issues of the nominations, my learned colleagues will say more about that. But uh, as we wait for their turn to come, the only two issues that we need, I need to say at this early stage is uh, to point out the fact that the, for, that under the constitutions, I believe Article 137 of the constitutions, any person occupying the office of uh, the deputy president or the office of the president must be qualified in accordance with the constitutions of Kenya. Under the impeachment articles of the constitutions, these issues of the constitutions on the qualifications are not set out. So that because they are not set out, it is an assumption that when reading the constitution holistically, this court will go to those other specific provisions of the constitutions where the issues of qualifications are set out. My Lord, uh, those issues of qualifications are many. One and the body under the constitution, my learned Ndego, colleague Mr. Ndego will say more about it, is that the IABC confirms whether any person has those qualifications or not. I don't think that is a contested issue. I believe it is also not a contested issue that at the time that the President of Kenya appears to have received some letter from IABC confirming that the Honorable Kindiki is duly qualified to hold the positions of, president, of deputy president, courtesy of Article 149 of the Constitution, we did not have IEBC. Of course, various arguments can be taken by the parties that are before you. Those arguments will, cannot be concluded. 
Those arguments can only be arguments to justify whether or not you will, the conservative orders will remain in place or not. But they'll have to be settled when the petition has been had. The second important issue on the aspect of uh, the nomination of Kindiki that I need to point out is this, that even assuming the president did the right thing and everything else that he was doing, this court should be concerned by the fact that whilst uh, the case was still going on before the Senate, eh, the National Assembly scheduled a meeting by the National Assembly, which under Article 149 has 60 days, a meeting to occur the following day, within about seven hours after the vote of the Senate. Why should this concern the court? It should concern the court for the simple reason that under Articles 10 and 118 of the Constitutions, Parliament cannot pass a law or make important decision like approval of the Honorable Kindiki without engaging in public participation. The cases are so many for me to cite them. The jurisprudence is so clear for it to be disputed. So that, my lord, the argument that we shall be putting on the issue of the nominations, on the face of it, unless this honorable court is able to say that at this stage that public participation does not apply to the nomination and approval by parliament, then, my lord, uh, it is clear that this is the kind of case in which you are duty bound to confirm the conservatory orders until this petition is hard and determined. Because the precondition would have to say, we have excluded this process from public participation. You would have to resolve the main issue, one of the main issues, at this stage before the petition has been heard. That would obviously be regular. Now, now none of us expect it to happen. I still wonder how the respondents would expect there for them to get such kind of an order. I go to the second test, and this is the test of whether those orders will be rendered negatory. My Lord, uh, again, I will not use the word no-brainer, but my Lord, uh, the, this is not a difficult argument to be able to resolve, and I believe I had uh, a little bit say something about it. But my Lord, the whole argument would be this, that if uh, the, the, the whole argument, that, and that has been our case since we first came here last Tuesday, that uh, we cannot, my Lord, be able to have a situation in which the petitioners are saying the constitutions of Kenya has been systematically violated. And that all these obsessions with the application to set aside the uh, conservatory orders that are in place are meant to complete the violations of the constitutions. My Lord, under the constitutions, your first duty is to defend the constitution. That duty is particularly greater for the simple reason, it is called Meduse. The, the MP, Metuse, that one. <laughs> when the, the mover of the motion had that duty under the constitutions, President of Kenya had that duty when conducting or uh, making appointment under 149, National Assembly had that duty and the Senate. But my Lord, you are saying in those five instances, the constitution has been violated. And because, my Lord, the Constitution has been violated by individual state officers who are under a duty to uphold the Constitution, then the duty of this court to ensure that we do not turn this Constitution into a mere platitudes, into a hollow document, a false prospectus, is all the more greater. And it is for those reasons, my Lord, that I would be saying that uh, everything would become negatory when we, they can be able to say, mission accomplished. Uh, they can go one day after the ruling. They can go to Huru Park or whichever other place for them to say, we are swearing Kintiki. That would be a mockery of justice. But there is a greater mockery of justice that I would want to point out. Because this thing, and to break it down for the people, every order, in the normal litigations we do with every day, and you say somebody's rights are going to be violated. 
If somebody is saying I should not be hanged, I was not convicted properly by the High Court, if my Lord, uh, that person is hanged because before he has been heard by the Court of Appeal, clearly it would mean that the, the process of justice had not been completed, yet we have hanged the guy. My Lord, in America, they keep on hanging people, many of them terrible criminals, mass killers. But my Lord, you will observe that uh, at the time when we see these televised killings in America, it is always after they have exhausted judicial process so that they are sure that process that are irreversible take place after every legal benefit and protection has been accorded. One of those that is important, my Lord, is captured under Article 27 of the Constitution, the right to protection of law. So that the issue, as long as I'm in court, the matter is not yet over. It might well be possible that uh, we might lose this application, the interim application that is before the court. But we might also win it, and we are likely to win it. So that because, my lord, of that issue, that a person may actually succeed at the other stage, is the reason why you prevent taking irreversible decisions. And my lord, what is the scenario that we are talking here? My lord, with the scenario here we are talking about here is simple, immediately, after the, assuming the orders were lifted, that's the scenario I want to describe. What is it that is going to happen? My Lord, we would have a scenario where the Chief Justice, whilst these proceedings are pending before the court, would have to preside over the swearing in of Honorable Kindiki. My Lord, is it in order for my Lord friend to keep speculating about the swearing in? Or Professor well, uh, the issue of and is also, and, and he's referred to it three times. Time. My well, Lord, I believe that's the law. I hear they have been saying they want and, to. And speak. my Lord, will ask you allow me. Then? I was to ask my Lord, what is the dispute uh, before you? Is it the impeachment and whether it was lawful, or is it the nomination of the second interested party? Because. First of all, it's both, and uh, I would want some protection for me to conclude so that we are all fair. They will have their time to respond, and I will not interfere with it. My Lord, so that the important scenario that uh, we must seek to avoid is a situation, and this is matter, it is also a matter both of the Constitution and Statute Law. My Lord, the issue is that if we get ourselves into a situation in which the Honorable, the Chief Justice, might have to preside over the swearing in of Honorable Kindiki while this petition is pending. My Lord, that, to borrow the words of Honorable, my friend, uh, Senior Counsel, would be the greatest absurdity that we can encounter. Why is it an absurdity? It's an absurdity, my Lord, for the simple reason that one of the authorities that we have cited is the Assumption of Office Act, where, because of the experiences that this, this republic went through in the years 2007, 2008, specific laws had to be made to ensure that not only that will this event be a public event. That's number one. But the more important issue from the standpoint of law is this, that before we get there, all legal disputes, contestations over the right to occupy that office would have been resolved. And my Lord, that is the reason precisely why they say, after the Supreme Court has confirmed the validity of those two positions, then you do the swearing. My Lord, it would amount to taking us back if that aspect, that rule of civilizations, were to be taken away on account of the setting aside of the conservatory orders that were issued and for very good reasons by your brother judges. I don't know whether there was a sister, by your brother judges. So that, my Lord, the issue, as far as we are concerned, that is an absolutely important issue. We go to the next important issue, public interest. My Lord, um, public interest, 
has been defined in very many cases that are before you. And my Lord, these public interest case issues are just supposed to ensure that uh, in administering justice, the court will do the right thing. Because we actually have a transformative, one of the best constitutions in the world, for the simple reason that we wanted to be a good example across the world as a leading constitutional democracy. And as a leading constitutional democracy, the issues of public interest is placed at the heart of our constitutional order. I go, my lord, to the definition. This is the only long passage that I will be reading. And this is, uh, I gave uh, the, the supplementary authorities earlier. This is in the famous case of uh, Murungaro, Christopher Darathi Murungaro versus Kenya Anti-Corruption. This I'm um, citing the passage appearing at page 7 to 8. My learned uh, senior, Gedu Muigai, will be familiar with this decision. My Lord, from the last paragraph, what did uh, the Court of Appeal say on public interest? I read, it says, it says as follows. Lastly, before we leave the matter, Professor Muigai told us that their strongest point on the motion before us is the public interest. We understood him to be saying that the Kenyan public is very impatient with the fact that cases involving corruption or economic crimes hardly go on in the courts because of applications like the one we are dealing with. Our short answer to Professor Mugai is this. We recognize and are all aware of the fact that the public has a legitimate interest in seeing that a crime of whatever nature is detected, prosecuted, and adequately punished. But in our view, the Constitution of the Republic is a reflection of the supreme public interest and its provision must be upheld by the courts, sometimes even to the annoyance of the public. The only institution charged with the duty to interpret the Constitution of the Republic and to enforce those provisions is the High Court, and where it is permissible with an appeal to the Court of Appeal. We have said before and we repeat it. The Kenyan nation has chosen the path of democracy. Our constitution itself talks of what is justifiable in a democratic society. Democracy is often an inefficient and at times a messy system. A dictatorship, on the other hand, might be quite efficient and less messy. In a dictatorship, we could simply round up all those persons we suspect to be involved in corruptions and economic crimes and simply lock them up without much ado. That is not the path Kenya has taken. It has opted for the rule of law, and the rule of law implies due process. The courts must stick to that path, even if the public may, in any particular case, want a contrary thing, and even if those who are mighty and powerful might ignore the court's decisions. Occasionally, those who have been mighty and powerful are the ones who have run to seek the protections of the courts when the circumstances have changed. The courts must continue to give justice to all and sundry, irrespective of their status or former status. What orders should we make in the motion before us? So that, my Lord, I make three points with regard to what is public interest, as understood by the Court of Appeal. Number one is that public interest means enforcement of the constitutions of Kenya. Secondly, my Lord, to make the point from what we have cited, that the first duty of ensuring that you both protect the constitution of Kenya and you protect public interest is vested in the High Court. Every other court above the High Court, the Court of Appeal, the Supreme Court, they can only do that on the basis that they are sitting in an appeal on a decision already made by the High Court. So that, my Lord, it will be the submission that this reinforces the huge burden that this court must undertake. And my Lord, the final issue that was being understood here is to say a constitutional democracy would not mean anything unless due process is upheld. And due process is the first duty of the High Court to ensure that in whatever dispute 
that is before the court, before it is decided, the court has confirmed due process has been observed and as a constitutional democracy. That is a standard because they call, try to compare ourselves with a dictatorship. That as a constitutional democracy, we can live with the decision. As my learned colleague Mr. Ngoya was saying, we cannot possibly believe with a decision in which we would be seeing the Chief Justice, well, if that were to be the case, you would be seeing the Chief Justice swearing on Rapokindiki while we are arguing this matter before the court. So that the rules are clear, the rules do not require much elaboration on what they mean. And since that criterion of public interest has been made by the Supreme Court itself, my Lord, I urge you to uphold it in the manner that will best ensure that the constitutions of Kenya and its dignity have been upheld. My Lord, there is uh, the question, so that I believe that we are very clear on public interest, except to emphasize that uh, for the specific specifics of this case, what does the call of public interest require this court to do? It's a simple call, five quick things. Number one, to confirm that the law on impeachment has been properly in interpreted and applied. That's the first issue to confirm that the laws on impeachment has been properly interpreted and applied. Number two is to achieve substantial just, substantive justice for the parties. So that uh, the, when we a uh, judgment will be issued by this court, at least uh, everybody can win something. That nobody goes home with a hall of victory. That is the whole idea of substantive justice. The third issue is uh, to determine that the issues of the violations of the constitutions uh, is done while the matter is still alive before the court. My Lord, very serious issues on Articles 27, 38, and 50 of the constitutions have been raised. They are all under the Bill of Rights. We urge that while public interest to be, needs to be upheld by ensuring that when this court pronounces itself in a judgment, those issues would not have been turned into academic. Number four, my lord, is uh, to ensure that the integrity of the presidential or political succession that is written in express law under our constitution is not rendered ridiculous or ineffective. And in those, I point out what we had said earlier, the desire of the makers of the constitution was any person who will hold the office of deputy president and therefore can potentially become president without an election ought himself to be an elected official. So that it's a big thing if this office, and without good reason, except political malice, is held by an appointed person. It is, there, it is in public interest that an elected deputy president, except for the clearest of evidence, except for the greatest of sins that are clear to all men of justice, is not removed from office. My Lord, the fifth issue is to do this, that this court protects the constitutions. I've already told, uh, talked something about it, so I don't have to go much into it. My Lord, uh, there, are only, there are only two decisions, before I sit down, that I would like to point myself to. There is the issues of Gedongori versus Attorney General. It is one of the cases that are before you. The facts in Gedongori are notorious. And they are also notorious for the simple reason that that decision, if those old advocates who are there, Kina Paul Muite and Dr. Gibson Kamaukuria tells us, they were, that it was largely, though it was a three-judge bench, it was written in the style of Chief Justice Madan. My Lord, that, that issue said something that is important to me, the younger advocates in Kenya. And what it said is this, it emphasized the question of justice. And it emphasizes the question of justice there is the simplest meaning in plain English. You need to ensure everybody has a, 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 a fair and square deal. This is to say that at the end of the day, everybody will leave the court and say, probably my advocate was not as good as I thought, but the judge did their best. But at the end of the day, let it be very clear that uh, the court did everything that is possible to ensure that uh, justice 
in its substantive form is achieved. This decision was rendered in 1984, long before the article on 159 was written. And that is why it is celebrated. And my Lord, it is also celebrated, and I am mentioning here for that reason, whenever honorable men uh, candidates before the Judicial Service Commission are called upon to name whose jurisprudence has affected them. It is uh, Justice Madan that is mentioned very many times. I will strive to be like Justice Madan. And my Lord, it is for good reason. All of us celebrate Justice Madan because he strived to do justice. But my Lord, in the same case, the older lawyers also told us about Alan Hancock, about Doug Dell, and even about Chunga. They tell us all these stories. But my Lord, in those interviews, I do not hear anybody saying I want to be like Alan Hancock. So that my Lord, I cite Madan in order to support the proposition that Judge Madan would never remove the conservatory orders that are before you. Under the principles of doing justice and offering everybody a fair and square deal. The last case that I would want to cite before I hand over to Melanie Kovic, Professor Ogada, has it gone? Oh, <laughs> I thought whether he has disappeared. My Lord, before I hand over to my learned colleague, is uh, to point out to one little issue. Uh, uh, the petitioners, um, you have exhausted two and a half hours. Uh, budget, how you are going to... Yes, sir. Yes, my Lord, we are budgeting. With the remaining... Yes. No more than 30 minutes. Yes, uh, but my Lord, my understanding... To submit on your side, yes, yes, we'll, have, we'll, we'll try to do we'll our best. have no more than 30 minutes. Thank you, we'll do our best. My Lord, uh, for purposes of uh, this case, is the only thing I'm citing before I go. This decision, like you've had very many other decisions on constituent power and everything, this will be an international decision. It's a decision that will be read by universities across the country. And therefore, the least that I can do is to confirm that the lawyers for the petition are still familiarize themselves as Macharia tried to do with what other courts internationally have said. There is just like a small issue that I want to address myself to. My Lord, uh, in 1928, in the case of Olmsted versus United States, one of the most celebrated justices of the U.S. Supreme Court, Justice Brandeis, says as follows. Uh, this is important. Our government is the potent, the omnipresent, teacher. For good or for ill, it teaches the whole people by its example. If the government becomes a lawbreaker, it breeds contempt for the law. It invites every man to become a law unto himself. It invites anarchy. End of quote. I quote the words of Justice Brandeis in order to make the point that in the matters, the proceedings before this court, we have been treated to a scenario under which an impeachment process that, if you read the constitutions clearly, is a process that ought to be a legislative one, a process conducted by the legislative organs of the Kenyan state has conver been converted into an uh, all organs of government project. With the result, my lord, that if the petitioners turns out to be right, you would then be found, find ourselves in a situation whereby, like in BBI, this process of impeachment of the deputy president may fall into, may end up being indicted as being a process that ended up being a government project contrary to what was clearly spelled out by our laws. And my Lord, if it turns out that all laws were broken and virtually out of the constitutions, I was counting them yesterday, it looks that 30 provisions of our constitutions have been seriously violated in the manner that this process has been undertaken. Then we have a situation that uh, Justice Brandeis had in mind when he talked about the government, which should be the lead in upholding the law, ends up being the principal breaker of the law. 
the principal violator of the constitutions. It is within your hands, your lordships, I mean your lordships, to ensure that does not become our scenario. My lord, Mashari and my colleague emphasized something, but I want to finish by adding something. My lord, in June 20, 1982, when Kenya was legislated, into saying that Kenya is a single party state and Kanu is the only legitimate organ. This was through a long process. Honorable Rengo, Honorable Muite, Gibson Kamaukuria have told me the intricacies of the day, what actually happened. My Lord, the month of October 2024, we have experienced events that the senior citizens of Kenya likened to the events of June 1982, when everything in Kenya suddenly changed. Kenya ended up to being a, it was a restricted democracy, but all the guardrails were removed after June 20, 1982. Your Lordships, I urge you that if these petitions, if these proceedings, end up in a manner that does not uphold our constitutions, then this constitution may face the same plight that the former constitution faced after the events of June 1982. We must hold and ensure the events of October 2024 remains regrettable and an aberration on Kenya's constitutional order, not the norm. My Lord, I, I am thankful for the time, my learned colleague, Mr. Ogada. Thank you. How many people are here to speak? For these applications, there are two. I was with Mr. Ogada and Mr. Degwa. They have heard you when you talk about 30 minutes. They will try to divide the time amongst themselves. My Lord. My Lord, I'm also. Uh, I'm 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 yes, my Lord, I was saying that. Uh, uh, we are also interested parties in the application and we require 15 minutes. We, we, will, we will reach you. Your time has not come. Your Lordship, the presiding judge. Your Lordship, Justice Mrima. Your Ladyship, Justice Mugambi. I will be brief. 